morning, everyone. <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is Jeff Crabtree, and uh, I serve as the chairman for the San Antonio Chamber of Commerce's Healthcare and Biosciences Committee. And welcome to our symposium on the Affordable Health Care Act. You know, uh, these times are very interesting that we live in. Having worked uh, with Methodist Healthcare now for some 25 years, I've seen a whole lot of change, uh, as everybody has in the healthcare industry. But when you think about the Affordable Health Care Act, and what this means to us as an industry, as to businesses in San Antonio, I think the change that we're going through in these next, uh, uh, these past couple of years and the next several years uh, is going to be very interesting, very impactful, and we have to prepare for it. And so welcome all of you to, to today's event. I, I know you'll have a lot of education. You'll walk away with some uh, good points. And just as importantly, you'll enjoy the networking that occurs when we get together like this. So take advantage of that as well. Uh, before I go any further, I, I would like to indicate that uh, you see a bunch of folks over here and a camera uh, in the back. And you'll have cameras in the other rooms as well because today we're broadcasting this on Nowcast. Uh, and that's uh, uh, over the Internet uh, worldwide. So we're, we're here to enjoy obviously not only our company but uh, the company of anybody and everybody who wishes to look at at this symposium uh, across the united states if not even further than that and by the way you can go on to nowcastsa.com and uh, and enjoy this uh, again and again and again if you'd like uh, down the road so if you miss something you can come back on nowcastsa.com and and uh, and enjoy what we've uh, what we've done well, before we go any further into the symposium, I do want to remind us about something very important. And as you all know, uh, today is the 12th anniversary of the attacks of 9-11. And 12 years ago, America confronted one of our darkest days when, when men and women of this great nation were taken from us in a series of, of catastrophic, horrific attacks. And not only young men and women and, and uh, older adults, but also first responders who, who raced into the inferno that was caused by 9-11 without any regards to their own lives and did immense rescuing and died as a result of, of those efforts in many cases. And you know, in the last 12 years, we've gone through a lot as Americans. Lots of change has occurred and virtually um, a whole entire landscape, and yet it's worth remembering what has not changed. The fact is our character as a nation has not changed, and our belief in America, founded on the ideals of, of, uh, of, of faith and freedom, has not changed as well. So let's at this time, if you don't mind, and I know you don't, spend just a, a moment remembering the brave men and women who died on this day 12 years ago and those first responders who didn't take a moment in consideration for trying to rescue those uh, from this terrible attack. So let's uh, observe a moment of silence. Thank you very much. Well, again, we appreciate you for attending our symposium today. It's, uh, it's an important symposium when we consider the ramifications of the Affordable uh, Care Act. And uh, as small businesses and large businesses, it affects us all. It also affects us in the healthcare industry. And, uh, and so we've we put together a, a large panel or good panel of folks to help us, whether we're a small business, an independent business, or a large business. And, um, and as every chamber event uh, that we have, it would, it's also very important to recognize the support of our sponsors that really make this happen. So I'd like to recognize our sponsors today, our silver sponsor, Cox and & Smith, and our bronze sponsors, Ernst & Young, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Texas, uh, Methodist Healthcare, SWBC, Wortham Insurance, and Risk Management. And please join with me in giving them a warm round of applause. <laughs> also, I'd like to thank the members of uh, our subcommittee uh, within the Healthcare Biosciences Committee that also worked very hard to put together this conference. 
and the co-chairs of the committee who you'll be hearing from shortly, Glenn uh, Geller from Low Campbell Ewald, and uh, Ewald rather, I'm sorry, Glenn, thank you very much, and, and uh, Andrew Boardman from Insperity. Andrew, thank you very much for your work. You are the folks who put this together, and, and you will be hearing from them in a moment. Also, Eric Smith from Wortham Insurance, uh, he was on the committee. Helen Williams from Workforce Solutions Alamo, and Jerry Baruki from uh, Alamo Colleges. So please help me recognize these hardworking individuals. At this time, I'd like to introduce uh, the uh, individual seated at our head table right in the middle. Uh, our breakfast keynote speaker, who we'll be hearing from very shortly, Joanna Andrigiani. I probably did not do a good job on that. Very close. I mean, what a terrific name, and I tried to get it. <laughs> I did it with my hands, too. I, just great. Well, uh, Joanna, or Joe for short, is a past president of the Texas Association of Health Underwriters. Uh, um, also, I'd like to uh, introduce the 2013 uh, chair-elect of your chamber and the president and CEO of Amigy Bank, uh, David McGee. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, Joss uh, Sutton, shareholder of Cox Smith, who you'll be hearing right after this uh, keynote presentation. Joss, we preach you, appreciate you being here. And Dana Krieg, Executive Director of Human Capital at Ernst & Young, will be coming shortly. And then President and CEO, our one and only, who we, none of us probably could do any of this without his support, I'm sure, Richard Press. Thank you very much, our Chamber of Commerce President. Okay. Um, at this time, uh, let me get off the stage and all the mistakes I've been making trying to get my tongue around my teeth and introduce to you um, uh, Andrew Boardman with uh, Insperity. Andrew has done a lot of hard work on putting this together along with his committee members. So Andrew, without further ado, come on up. Good morning, everyone. Um, the uh, Healthcare and Bioscience Committee of the San Antonio Chamber is excited to put on a symposium today focused on the Affordable Care Act and the many impacts that it will have on our business community. Your Chamber's Healthcare and Bioscience Committee was formed over 10 years ago when members of our industry came forward and advocated for an increased focus by your Chamber. Over the past decade, this committee has been a primary advocate for the local health industry has produced an annual economic impact study that depicts the strength and size of the industry and was responsible for the creation of Biomed San Antonio, a nonprofit that does a tremendous job of promoting the assets of the local biomedical industry. This year, our committee focused on developing a sound mission and purpose and better defining the value that our group brings to its members and to the chamber as a whole. One of the issues that the committee uh, was tasked or asked to address was the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and we were charged with being a resource to small and medium-sized chamber members and kind of help you navigate the, uh, the maze that this, this um, legislation represents. Thus, the concept of a symposium was created, and we're fortunate to have the expertise of many local firms here today um, to help us better understand the Affordable Care Act and how it will impact your business. Our committee is focused on continuing to be an ongoing resource to the chamber membership, and this event will serve as a start of various events and resources that we push out to chamber member businesses with pertinent information pertaining to healthcare and how it will affect their business in the coming months and years. We hope you find the speakers and breakout sessions over the next several hours useful and insightful. And at this time, I'd like to introduce my co-chair uh, for the event, Glenn Geller, with Lowe Campbell Ewald, to come forward and introduce our keynote speaker. Okay, good morning, everybody. Everybody awake, and uh, thanks for the introductions, everybody. And also, I, uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't, if I didn't take just a moment to recognize uh, really the team that made this happen. Will Garrett and his team, Lisa's here, uh, Becky Bridges, the whole uh, uh, behind the scenes. Uh, it's my first time working with them, and it's just amazing. Uh, they did all the heavy lifting, so they made. Uh, this day relatively easy for uh, myself and Andrew, uh, I think, so thank you. Um, at this time, it's my pleasure to recognize your breakfast keynote speaker, Joanna Anton Giovanni, a great Texas name. Uh, <laughs> Joanna is an employee benefit specialist at Wortham Insurance. 
risk management and benefits. She's a graduate of Texas A&M University, and I know in Texas, right, people get a little yoo-hoo or some, you know, A&M Aggies out there. Okay. And she brings 18 years of employee benefit experience guiding employers of all sizes on employee benefit plan design, vendor selection, data analysis, compliance, wellness implementation, problem resolution, and plan administration. And I'm sure there's a few other things she does that weren't on my list here. Joanna is past president for the Texas Association of Health Underwriters and provides critical expertise in matters related to the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, which is what we're all here to talk about today. She also plays a vital role in lobbying in Austin and Washington, D.C. on behalf of, of uh, the state's uh, insurance professionals and businesses like yours affected by health care reform. So please join me in welcoming Joanna to the stage. And the clear they're supposed to be over here, but then I found out I might be on camera. Okay. Can you hear me? Is that good? Okay. I think the clicker, is the clicker up here now? Oh, very good. Okay. So I'm going to come up here. I thought maybe I'd be down there. Um, not only does my last name warrant the fact that I use my hands when I talk, but I also move around quite a bit too. I have a hard time staying still. But thank you guys so much um, for having me today. I really feel honored to start this day. You guys have some excellent speakers and um, a lot of folks have worked really hard to get here today. So I'm just really happy to be here. I will say I've presented with Josh Sutton before. Oh, here he is. He's walking back in now. And typically, my disclaimer is a little bit different than Josh's, who is an attorney, where his stuff might say something like, you know, this um, is not a, um, you know, legal advice in any way. But I usually have a slide that has a crystal ball that we've used before in the past. And the crystal ball basically just said we didn't always know what was going to happen with the Affordable Care Act. But I have changed. Josh, you'll be happy to know I have changed my slide. Now my disclaimer is that we do know a lot of what's going on. However, we have not been down this road before. So the Affordable Care Act changes everything in our world on January 1st, 2014. Our country has never had an individual mandate. Never before have employers had to participate in the health care. They have before, but they haven't had to, right? We've never had insurance exchanges. And so all of a sudden, our products that we're selling look totally different. So this is a road we've never been down. It reminds me, I was telling Josh when I got here about my daughter. I have three girls, and my oldest is 15. She gets her driver's license in three weeks. It's very scary. I'm really nervous about it. So much so, she, Emma is, she's a great driver, but her problem is her lack of direction and where she's going. So the other day, we're driving down the road, and I said, Emma, I need you to drive us home, and I'm not going to give you any direction whatsoever. She's like, yeah, I got this, Mom, I got this, I got this. So we're driving, and I'm thinking to myself, surely she's going to look over her right shoulder, put her right blinker on, and get off at our exit, right? And I'm sitting there, and I'm sitting there, and she drives right past it. So then I thought, well, we've got two exits in our, to get to our neighborhood. Surely she's going to put her blinker on now. She's going to look over her shoulder now, and then we drive right past that exit as well. So I thought, well, how long can I hold my tongue? Well, I can hold my tongue for two minutes, and that's as long as I can hold my tongue. So now I know the answer to that. I get tested all the time by my kids. So I can hold my tongue for two minutes. And so I say, Emma, where are you going? What, what, you missed, you're lost. You missed our exit. She says, she's all calm. And she's like, Mom, you cannot get lost if you don't know where you're going. I was like, yeah. And I'm thinking about that thought. And then she said, besides, my favorite song was on. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, well, as long as her favorite song's on, maybe she, she said, oh, maybe not. I'm not quite sure. But... <laughs> But I trust the information that the driver's ed folks gave her to keep her going. But I'll tell you, it's almost painful from the passenger seat than it is in the driver's seat, right? And that's where we are going in 2014. So this next 45 minutes is your crash course of a driver's ed course to tell you about the Affordable Care Act. And then I'm going to move you guys into different rooms, and you're going to be working with the driver's ed drivers. 
that will tell you how to drive your car when we get there. Although I'll tell you, not one of us has experienced this. So it's going to be different from the passenger seat as well as it will be from the driver's seat, but we're all going to be in that driver's seat. So this applies to all of us in the room. So let's get going with that. That one's better than the, the crystal ball, right? Yeah. So you, and I, so I say we've never experienced this. Do any of these words on this screen um, look different to you? With the Affordable Care Act that has 2,600 pages of legislation, we now have 18,000 pages of guidance. We have all new definitions. So my idea this morning for the first 45 minutes is to talk to you about definitions. And then what I'd like to do is invite you to write down words that you may not know or that may have intrigued you. And then when we go to our breakout sessions, that's where you should be able to ask about those definitions. So I'm going to skim through a lot which I can promise you that I could dive a lot deeper into each of these different things, but just for the sake of time and to make sure we get through a lot, we're going to go over them. So I don't want you to feel like you're going to learn everything you need to know in the next 45 minutes, but what I hope to do is pique your interest and maybe even get you to jot down some words that our driver's ed instructors can help you with along the way, okay? Okay, so with this agenda, we're going to talk about a few common misperceptions. We hear a lot of people say, oh, it doesn't apply to me. Right? So we're going to talk about a few common misperceptions misperce as it relates to the individual mandate, the employer shared responsibility, and then, and that's where really we have um, breakout sessions to talk to about the employer's um, piece of this. But what I'd like to do is talk about the, uh, the exchange that's coming about. Everyone's hearing about the exchange that's coming. So we're going to talk about the basics of the exchange. Really, what types of plans are you going to find in there? And um, what is that going to be like? So we're going to talk about that. And then I'm going to briefly touch on product modifications and changes. Because the insurance card in your wallet that you have today is not going to be the same insurance card that you have in your wallet in 2014. Okay. Now the compliance piece of this, I'm going to briefly touch. Because Josh is going to spend uh, some great quality time with you guys when I'm done talking about compliance. So the first common misperception is, I'm covered through my employer, so this doesn't apply to me. I hear that so much. Oh, I get my insurance through my employer. This doesn't apply to me. Why does it apply? Because we're American citizens, right? And everyone now has an individual mandate starting in 2014. So in, when you file your taxes in 2015, you have to show proof of insurance. You can't go longer than three months being uninsured in 2014. Okay? So um, we have people oftentimes right now that are Maybe their employer's anniversary date is June, and they waive coverage. So they won't be offered coverage again until June of 2014. That'll put them longer than three months uninsured in 2014, right? So it's important for everybody to know that you cannot go longer than three months in 2014 without being insured. So everyone must have insurance except the exceptions. <laughs> Isn't that, there's always exceptions, right? <laughs> so there are exceptions. And quite honestly, the exceptions will be granted in the exchange. So we're going to spend some time talking about the exchange in a minute. But what happens if we don't have insurance? In 2014, it's a $95 penalty per adult um, at, or 1% of your income, whichever is greater. Now, I've heard people say, well, that's not very much. The, the cost for insurance costs, that, costs more than that. Well, that may be true. But I will tell you that each year, that penalty gets a little bit stiffer. Okay? In 2016, it's $695 per adult, or two and a half times your income. So each family could have a potential maximum of $2,085 in 2016. So that might make someone think, right? So we all have to have insurance except for the exceptions. This is really what the market landscape will look like. We are going to see quite a few people. Now, we have Medicaid in Texas, right? Now, we're not expanding Medicaid, but I will tell you that we will probably have more people, now that they're required to have insurance, join programs that are currently available and they might be eligible for now, but we'll actually see them enroll. Um, CHIP, for example. 40% of people that are eligible for their children to be covered through the CHIP program are not currently covering their kids. So we will probably see people that will actually enroll in programs that are available to them. So government programs are going to be huge. Large group employers and health plans, there's a definition for large group. In Texas, it's going to be 51 and above for large group until 2016. Then a small employer is 100 and below. Okay? Then we're for the individual and small group, we're going to have exchange products. Now, we're going to talk about the exchange, but you can buy individual insurance both in the exchange and outside of the exchange. Now, there's going to be a chunk of us that have a grandfathered plan. And if you don't know if you have a grandfathered plan, I'm here to tell you that you don't. 
okay? Because you would have had to certify that yourself, that you've had the same plan since March of 2000, since the bill was enacted, okay? So in 2010. So if you are not sure if you have a grandfathered plan, you probably don't have a grandfathered plan, if you're the employer, that is, okay? So another factor, fission. All businesses will be required to provide health insurance. That's not true. Not all businesses are going to be required to offer health insurance. Only the applicable large employers. Okay, that's a new word. And with an applicable large employer becomes our shared employer shared responsibility. Now, we just recently heard that there was a delay. So what that means is if you're an applicable large employer, and we're going to talk about the definition of that in just a minute, that you were supposed to have offered insurance by January 1st of 2014. That was pushed back one year to 2015, which quite honestly helps large employers quite a, quite a bit, especially because the counting of employees has become so important. And we're going to talk about that. I'm going to show you some things, and then we're going to have a breakout session just on counting employees, which is really, really important with this law going forward. But with the um, employer shared responsibility, you've got the applicable large employer, which basically means that you have 50 or more full-time and full-time equivalent employees. Now, in the breakout session, they're going to do that math for you. They're going to help you with that. So I'm not going to spend too much time with that. But if you are an applicable large employer, you're required to offer minimum essential coverage at an affordable price to employees working an average of 30 hours or more a week or 130 hours a month. Okay. So that's your requirement. And if you don't do minimum essential coverage at an affordable price, there could be an A penalty or a B penalty. Now you'll notice Josh's slides that say 4980HA, 4980HB. Yeah, so he's got the legal version of what those penalties are. But there's two different penalties that an applicable large employer might have to, um, might have to pay. So that's why the count. Now the count has many definitions now, right? You can, by definition, by statute, be both a large employer and a small employer. So if somebody says to you, are you a large employer? You say, in reference to what? Because you can be both a large group and a small group employer. So we have different calculations that we're using. The first one is for ALE. Are you an applicable large employer? That is the count, and that's a monthly count. So ever, all the employers that especially we all should, quite honestly, have a way to know how many employees we have by month. How many are working 30 hours or more a week? And then how many aren't, the part-time employees? Because we're going to count those number of hours because that all adds up into our, our equivalents, okay? So the applicable large employers may be subject to penalties and they have to offer minimum essential coverage at an affordable price. The other reason why count is important is because AT&E, I got an email the other day from one of my insurance carriers and then the subject line said, AT&E audit. What? Average total number of employees. Never seen an audit like that in my whole life. So I had to figure out what is this all about, right? The average total number of employees, you add up all of your employees, part-time, seasonal, all of them. Full-time, you add up all of them. And if you're over 50, then you could get a large group segment quote. So your average total number of employees determines by the, for the carrier which segment you're in, but your ALE determines if you're penalty eligible. So these are things we're going to talk about in breakout sessions, but I want to make sure you know that counting is important. It even gets more complex with the counting, and I don't want to lose you here, but what I want to do is make sure that you guys know that you're going to have to have a way of, of keeping track or record keeping for employees. You want to track the number of hours. Are they 30 hours or more a week? We don't know, right? We need to be able to track that, determine if they're eligible or not. We also have a new term in the legislation called variable hour employee. And a variable hour employee is variable. It basically means when I hire you, I have no, no idea how many hours you're going to work. So let's say I hire a wait staff. And I think you're going to be a great employee. I think you're going to take as many hours as you can. But I, then all of a sudden, something happens at home, or maybe you take more classes at school and you're not working as much as I thought you would work. So oftentimes we hire people and we don't know how many hours they're going to work. A variable hour employee allows an employer when they calculate to have up to a 13 month waiting period for new employees. So that's something that's new. If you're interested in that, then you should look at the calculations for that. There's also affordability. The word affordability is now a big term with the Affordable Care Act, right? It's in the name. 
for an employer, there's three different safe harbors that you can use to determine whether it's deemed affordable for that employee or not. And the calculation for each of those things is different. So it may help you as an employer to use one method versus another. So those are the types of things that you're going to be looking at as an employer. But we do know that the penalties were delayed. Again, we have the A penalty and the B penalty. The A penalty is the minimum essential coverage penalty. So I'd like to take a minute and talk about what minimum essential coverage is. And then also the unaffordable factor. We're going to take a look at an example of the unaffordable factor. It's a $2,000 per penalty per person for an A penalty. And if it's a $3,000 per person, now, it's only if someone goes into the exchange. And again, I, I said that. Uh, very loosely the way I described the 2,000 or the 3,000 because there's a calculation with all of that and we're going to go into that in the breakout session so I really won't spend too much time. What I want to concentrate on is the minimum essential coverage and the affordability part. So when we talk about our plan, I say, what type of insurance do you have right now? And you might say to me, well, I have a $2,000 deductible, $25 office visit copay, right? That's how we describe it. Characteristically, that's how we describe our insurance right now, right? Well, going forward in 2014, we're going to say, I have a minimum value of 70%. I have a minimum value of 60%. When we're a large group employer, our plans will now be defined by having a value. Now, that value will then keep an employer from not having to get a penalty, the value of that plan. So it's going to be very important to an employer what the value of their plan is. Now, when we talk about minimum value, basically what it we're referring to is not the cost of insurance at all. It has nothing to do with premium, how much you pay for the insurance. The value of the plan has to do with a member actually using the insurance and how much their exposure might be for claims. There are claims in, spe in four specific categories, physician services, hospital services, pharmacy, and lab and x-ray. The other thing that's interesting is if I say, well, what does your plan look like right now? $25 office visit copay, $75 at the ER. Now, in our world right now, if we pay our $25 copay at the doctor's office, we are perfectly content with the goods and services we receive for that $25, are we not? We're happy. It's 25 bucks, right? That's what I paid when I went there. Then that doctor sends me to the pharmacy and I paid $40 for my prescription. Again, I'm happy with the goods and services I received for my $40. Perfectly content. In our world going forward in 2014, those copays go towards your out-of-pocket maximum. So before when we had Copay Island, the copays, you can pay copays and copays and copays. Now they actually count towards something. So that's why if someone says, oh, I'll just keep the plan that I have. If you're on an individual plan, if you're on a small group plan, large group plan, it's not going to be the same plan. Your copays are going to go towards your out-of-pocket maximum, assuming you have copays on your plan. So everyone's insurance will change, not on January 1st, but when your plan renews in 2014. Okay? Now I'll tell you also that the out-of-pocket maximum is tied to our HSA plans are high deductible health plans. They're not HSA plans, they're HSA qualified. They're high deductible health plans. So in 2014, that magic number for your out of pocket is $6,350. Now I normally wouldn't talk about math in a room like this because then I start messing people up with, equa with uh, doing math in their head. But the 6350 is a very important number. Because I, when I mentioned that the co-pays go towards your out of pocket and the deductibles and the co-insurance, they all go to 6350. So if I have a minimum value on my plan of 60%, I'm looking at a maximum out of pocket of 6350. So if the value of my plan is a 70%, that the out of pocket maximum goes up. If it's an 80%, it goes up. So or I should say goes down. That's the right way to say it. So maybe you'd have a $5,000 exposure instead of 6350, right? So that's how we're able to calculate the value. It's your maximum exposure and everything, all the services that you receive go towards the out-of-pocket maximum when it never used to do that before. Now when we talk about affordability of the plan, what's affordable to you may not be affordable to me, right? I mean, I'm not going to go spend $200 on a pair of shoes, whereas my sister may do that. <laughs> she's in the front row right here. <laughs> I know she does that. <laughs> but, but I'm not going to do that, okay? <laughs> but so it's defined in the legislation what affordable is for health care. It's 9.5% of someone's income. That's what's affordable, okay? Now, there's safe harbors because when we talk about the exchange, which we're going to talk about in just a minute, that the affordability of the insurance comes into account, the 9.5% of income comes into account in the exchange as household income. But from an employer's perspective, 
it's you have the safe harbors that you're responsible for doing the nine and a half percent affordability based on the employee's income okay and it's the lowest option minimum value plan that you offer your employees so you might offer three or four different plans to your employees but the lowest option plan the price that they would have to pay for that plan can't be more than nine and a half percent of their income so let's say regardless of what the plan looks like right so let's look for an example of for the W-2 right here. If somebody makes $24,000 a year, which is $2,000 a month, they cannot pay more than 9.5% of their income, which means we cannot charge the employee more than $190 a month. So if we have a $400 rate and I pay 50% as an employer, I'm going to charge my employees $200 and I pay $200. It will be deemed unaffordable because I can't charge my employee more than $190 a month. Okay? Now, if that employee went to the exchange, my employer would receive a $3,000 penalty for that one employee because it's deemed unaffordable for that one employee. So that's why affordability matters. So Texas won't have an exchange. I hear that all the time. Is that fact or fiction? Yeah, it's fiction. We, I mean, it's, it, we are definitely having an exchange. So let's talk about the exchange because the exchange, every state must have an exchange on January 1st, 2014. And if we don't open our own, the federal government will open one for us. Okay? Don't let the word exchange scare you too much. That's what I've heard so many people talk about exchanges. They go, oh my gosh, it's just like this crazy, I don't even know what this is, right? We have exchanges right now. Okay? We've got the New York Stock Exchange. Farmer's Market. Those are exchanges, right? We also have Travelocity, and I will tell you that the administration specifically said that the health insurance exchange should look like Travelocity. So these are the types of exchanges that we're already using. We just never had them as it relates to buying health insurance, although we have actually. Okay? So let's talk about the basis of the exchange. And again, this is where I'm going to get some definitions and stuff going for you, because I want to make sure we talk about some key pieces. Qualified health plans. Do you have a qualified health plan? When I ask you that, don't get concerned. It could be Aetna, Blue Cross, United Healthcare. It could be all the names we know and love today. But a qualified health plan just means it has to cover certain things. It has to be certified by the exchange to be a QHP is another term for that. There's going to be three different kinds of entities that will be able to sell plans on the exchange. Your traditional health insurance carriers, like I mentioned, Aetna, Blue Cross, United Healthcare, those types of companies. We're going to have co-op plans. I've got to tell you, I haven't seen a whole lot of traction on the co-op plans. So I wouldn't be too nervous about that yet. And then multi-state plans. The OPM, Office of Personnel Management, will have two different plans on the federal exchange. One of them will probably be a carrier that we know and love, and the other will be a nonprofit agency that, will have, that could have a plan there. Okay? So all the states will have to decide. There's three different design options that a state can choose from. Do I want to create my own exchange, which we have, I think, 17 states that did that? Do I want a partnership? Or do I want to be a federally facilitated exchange? And this is the map of the country. You can see Texas in yellow is the federally facilitated exchange, and we're not alone. But just because we're going to use the federally facilitated exchange in 2014 doesn't mean we can't pass legislation in the next year or the next year or the next year and get our own exchange. We might want to see how the other ones operate before we open our own. Okay? So just because we're doing a federally facilitated exchange in January, for one, we're not alone, but for two, doesn't mean we can always be that way. It can change. Okay? So let's talk about the exchange. There's two pieces of the exchange, although it's one portal. And I do actually believe that that is going to be the logo for the exchange. Um, when I was in D.C. a couple months ago, they said that they didn't like the word exchange because they didn't like the way it translated in Spanish, so now it's called marketplace instead. So it's going to be the health insurance marketplace. That's how we'll see, that's how we'll hear the word um, exchange, the federally facilitated exchange. But there's two different options for you. Now again, think about it as a computer screen that you're going to log on to, although there is an 800 number that you can call, okay? And you're going to either go one of two directions. You're going to go to the shop exchange, which is the small business health options program for small employers. We're going to have one carrier on the shop exchange in Texas. It's going to be probably Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, and I don't know exactly what the product looks like there. Actually, I'll be in the uh, meeting in Austin tomorrow to find out all the products there. But, but we'll probably have one shop pro, uh, product for small business employers. The other exchange that we're going to hear more traction on, and the reason why people will really go there, is for the individual 
Exchange. And the actual name of that is the American Health Benefit Exchange. That's the actual formal name for it in the legislation. But that's where an individual might go to get subsidized health care in addition to going to just buying health care. So you can buy insurance in the exchange and not get a subsidy for it. Okay? However, I will tell you, when we think about a subsidy right now, our minds think low income. That's just kind of what we think sometimes, right? But I'll tell you that that is not the definition of subsidy going forward. You can be a family of four making $90,000 a year and qualify for a subsidy. So we will have a lot more people that qualify for a subsidy within the exchange. Now the first thing I want you to know is if you have employer-sponsored coverage that's minimum value at an affordable price, you're disqualified from a subsidy within the exchange, whether you're a dependent or an employee. There's five key purposes of the exchange, and I'm not going to go into this too much except for to say the five main topics, the things that they're looking at is consumer assistance. We're going to hear a new word called a navigator. A navigator can be an agent, but doesn't have to be a licensed agent, okay? But they were able to help you get your plan. Then plan management, the eligibility. The eligibility is so important because when you call in or when you log in, that's going to determine whether you're sell, uh, subsidy eligible. Or what if you call in or you dial in and then all of a sudden you find out, hey, I'm Medicaid eligible. I didn't even know it. So that, that portal will be able to help you figure out what you're eligible for. Okay? And the enrollment function of it, for the employees to be able to get those, or the individual to be able to get that plan and then the financial management. Financial management, we think of it more like running a business. And we think of financial management rather than how much it costs there. But this is Xerox um, was hired as a consultant for, for, the, um, for the government to determine what the federally facilitated exchange will look like. I'm not going to go through this graph. I think the visual that I want you guys to get with this graph is that anywhere you see in purple, those are the federal agencies that will be working within the federal exchange. So this is our kind of our federal, uh, federal data hub. And these are the agencies that would be able to determine eligibility and be able to determine whether or not you qualify for a subsidy. So they're going to be talking to employers. Someone shows up at the exchange, they're going to get in touch with your employer to see if you have an offer of minimum essential coverage at an affordable price, right? So there's eight different federal agencies that will have access to the information in the exchange. This is a simpler on the eyes version of what the exchange, this is also by Xerox, but this kind of describes what it would look like, something maybe from the outside rather than that other graph was looking at the inside. But they expect that 29 million people will be covered in the health insurance exchange by 2019. And when somebody gets there, they'll be able to determine their Medicaid, their CHIP, their public subsidy eligibility, or their employer-based option, which is that SHOP program. So they'll all be able to do that in one place. HIX is an acronym we're using quite often for health insurance exchange. So if you see HIX, that means health insurance exchange. So what's covered once you get to that exchange, right? We have to have benchmarks. And so they decided that each state would have a certain benchmark. Texas decided that we would just default to what the legislation said. And we're not alone. We're the yellow states again with a lot of other states that, bench, that, um, that uh, just did the fallback. So we have essential health benefits. Our essential health benefits in Texas will be mirrored after Blue Cross Blue Shield. And I wrote down on the side right here what that benchmark plan is. It's RS26. I mean, like we got the definition of the plan name in there. So we know what our essential health benefits are. There are 10 categories that must be covered by a qualified health plan. So there's 10 categories that must be covered in there. Once those 10 things are covered in there, then we can buy the insurance. And the way that the insurance will work is you're going to have different plan levels. They're, we call them the metal plans, bronze, silver, gold, platinum. And then this is where our co-pays might change, our deductibles might change, the co-insurance might change. So if you have a bronze level plan, it's going to cost less, but you're going to have more exposure at the doctor's office compared to the platinum plan, which is going to cost more on a monthly basis. So a higher utilizer might want the platinum plan, but you're going to pay less when you get to the doctor's office. Now, each one of these bronze, silver, gold, and platinum plans has a value, and that's an actuarial value. And I'm here to tell you that minimum value and actuarial value are two different things. Minimum value has to deal with an employer. Actuarial value has to do with individual and small group. They're similar, but the calculators are different, so I just want to make sure you know that they're a little bit different. But we've already kind of talked about what minimum value is, and so actuarial value is very much similar to that. But that will tell you what that plan is, the value of that plan is worth to determine the cost for you. 
Once we determine what the cost of that plan is, then we look to see your eligibility to see if you get a subsidy to pay for that plan. So based on your income, up to 100% of the federal poverty level, you could, get a, you could get a subsidy to help pay for the price of that insurance. And then also when we hit that 200 to 250% of federal poverty level, right in the middle, you have cost sharing options as well. So that means you might get the gold plan for the silver price. Okay? All that, that eligibility will be determined when you get into the exchange. So here's an example, and it might be hard for you guys to see, so I'll just kind of talk through this quickly. If the plan costs, if someone makes $80,000 a year with a family of four, and the plan is anticipated to cost $12,130, based on 9.5% of that person's income, that means that they shouldn't pay more than $7,600. So that means that the government tax credit will be $4,530. Now, when they pay for that insurance, they will be paying the $7,600, and the exchange will be paying the $4,530 for them. So the insurance company gets it right away. Okay? It's an upfront subsidy. Okay? There are some financial calculators um, that you guys can go to. So I, we will have these slides posted for you guys, so you can go back and get to these slides here. Now, an employer has to have their exchange notification out quickly. By October 1st, you have to have that exchange notice out. So if you have not gotten it out, please touch base with your insurance broker. They need to get you that form, or you can go onto the Department of Labor. They've got the model notices there. There's one for people that are offering insurance, and a separate one for people who are not currently offering insurance. There's one in Spanish for both of those as well. So there's four different exchange notices, and all the employers need to um, give that exchange notice out. It has to be out by October 1st, and then once January 1st comes, you have to give it out to your employees within 14 days of data hire. So I keep telling all my employers, when they fill out an I-9 to come work for you, that's when you give them their exchange notice. Don't do it when they're eligible for their health insurance, which might be 60 or 90 days later, right? This is my favorite exchange notice. Dear employee, there's an exchange. Please go there and determine if I, if, please go there and see if I owe a fine. Because just as a reminder, all fines for an employer are determined at the exchange. I have a law firm and everybody is a very high income, they have over 50 full-time equivalents at the law firm, they just choose not to offer insurance because everyone's doing their own thing, no one goes into the exchange, they'll never get a fine for not offering insurance there. It has to have someone go to the exchange in order for the employer to get a fine. Okay, there are going to be open enrollment dates. I hear people say, well, what if I break my leg? I just go to the hospital and then I'll just get my, buy my insurance then. I hear that oftentimes too. There are going to be open enrollment dates. And initially, the open enrollment is October 1st through March 31st of 2014. So we have a six-month period. And then after that, it coincides with Medicare and open enrollment. Unless you have a, a qualifying event, you can come on at a different time. The word exchange, again, we hear it, it's a buzzword. So if I hear that exchange is popular, then if I'm thinking of how to sell insurance, I might say, well, I'm going to open my own exchange. And so that's what we have. We have a lot of other exchanges. The insurance carriers are getting exchanges. Um, insurance brokerage agencies are starting their own exchanges. So don't be concerned. But basically, it's an offer of insurance that should help you to buy insurance. So the only way you're going to get a subsidy is in, through the federal exchange. But you can see exchanges outside in the open market as well. So who's going to buy in the public exchange? It's going to be people that have between 100 and 400% of the federal poverty level. Those are probably the ones that are going to buy in the public exchange. Or if you're a small business employer and your average employees are, um, if you have 10 or fewer employees averaging $25,000 a year, you can get a small business tax credit in the exchange, in the shop program. Outside the market, I think that's pretty much, we'll still see the market that we see it today. We have exchanges. I mentioned at the very beginning, this is Medicare.gov. We currently have an exchange where people can buy insurance right now. So it's not a scary thing for us. Okay. Actually, I'm going to go through right here because I want to talk about a couple product modifications. But I think we're getting close on time here. In the small group market, our world changes for various different reasons. For now, your rates can only be charged a rate for your age, where you live, and if you smoke or not. That's what the small group market looks like. So oftentimes I'll have employers that have uh, maybe 49 employees and they say, should I stay small employer so that I don't get penalties? And my, my thought is, well, that small group market might cost more. So sometimes if you're already offering minimum essential coverage at an affordable price, you're not going to get penalized. So sometimes it's best to be in the large group market. You might get different rates that might be better rates for you. So if you're close there, you should visit with your insurance broker to talk about that. 
In the small group market, you can't have a deductible more than $2,000 or $4,000 for a family. Now, they did come out with guidance recently that said that if an insurance carrier needs to um, have a deductible higher than that to meet the bronze level, then that's okay. So I know that there's going to be a couple $3,000 and $4,000 deductibles that are out there. Okay? The other thing that's important to know is 105H. What? Non-discrimination. Small employers have never had to worry about non-discrimination before, so we have to worry about that now. You're going to start seeing on January 1st taxes and fees on your insurance policies. You might see it with some carriers. They're starting to, the bill will actually start on January 1st. The other ones will wait until after you renew. But again, we're going to, I'll put this stuff online for you so that you can go look to see what the taxes and fees are. But we're going to have some fees that start on January 1st, okay, depending on which carrier that you've got. So in summary, are you a large employer? Are you 50 plus? You need to determine whether you're an applicable large employer because then you'd have to offer minimum essential coverage at an affordable price for employees that work more than 30 hours or more a week. If you're a small employer, you're going to have enhanced benefits, but the rates could change because we're going to that a community rating model. It's a different system. Um, employers cannot have an eligibility period longer than 90 days going forward. So that means if you have the first of the month following 90 days right now for your new hires, that, you can't have that anymore. Um, our recommendation is to go first the month following 60 days. Otherwise, you're, you're left prorating premiums to get to that 90th day. Okay? There are going to be some new compliance. Um, we've got the exchange notice. And we've got some required taxes that we're going to be paying in Jan on January 1st. And then there's going to be product modifications for all of us. So prepare for more legislation and changes. We already know that the, the um, administration had told us, let's pass it and see what's in it. Right? So we're going to probably have some changes along the way. And that's okay, but, but be prepared for the changes that might come. Okay? There's some additional resources that I've got there for you, so enjoy the ride. And, you know, as my daughter Emma would say, just turn the music on. It might be more enjoyable. <laughs> anyway, so thank you very much. Okay, so the first question I have is, did everybody get that? You got it? Uh, Wortham does have a, uh, they have uh, uh, folks here to chat with you later uh, during some of your breaks, so please take advantage of it. And Joanna, thank you for setting the stage for the next two and a half hours. Uh, as Joanna said, we're going to go in more depth in our breakout sessions uh, immediately following this. And Joanna, we really appreciate you taking the time today to come out and uh, share this with us. Um, I wish you had just squeezed in a little bit more. I don't know. Uh, it was a little. Uh, as a token of our appreciation, Joanna, we have a small gift for you that before you leave, uh, we'll get it to you. Uh, you truly are a leader in this space and an expert in all things related to ACA. And uh, we've gotten you Bill George's national bestseller uh, called True North, titled True North, which the New, York, the New York Times calls one of the most important books on leadership to come in years. Also uh, important for us to recognize, George is also CEO of Medtronic, so um, happens to play in this space as well. Okay, what's gonna happen now? We're gonna take a 10 minute break, get something to eat, whatever you need to do. And following that break, we're gonna have a general session for everybody right next door. And uh, it's for all attendees. The session will feature Joshua Sutton Joshua's right back there, you'll see him in a moment, from Cox Smith as he discusses the compliance side of Affordable Care Act. Uh, following that session, we'll begin two concurrent breakout sessions in rooms A and B, and if you look at the program you have, uh, the uh, topics being covered uh, are noted in there. Each session will run twice, so you're not going to miss anything. Uh, you could take A first and B second, or B first and A second and you'll get all the uh, informations, and the rooms are labeled on the outside. Thank you again for being here, and we'll see you back in this room around 11.45 for our luncheon program, so enjoy the morning. Thank you.